Amir? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, without taking any more time, I would like to introduce the chair of this session, Dr. Gökçe Çataloluk. Hello, good afternoon to you all. And um, this is Gökçe Çataloluk from Istanbul. Uh, I'm a member of the Turkish session of the IVR and currently employed in Istanbul Bilgi University, Faculty of Law. And um, I would like to, uh, before starting to moderate this session, I would like to thank once again, Professor Kuchuradi and Professor Uygur for making this happen, for letting us see each other even under these circumstances. So um, this is the third session, but uh, we have uh, a few changes. Um, is Professor Mario Filio here? Professor Mario Filio. So it looks like one of the participants is uh, not here again. So um, we already know that uh, Professor Bantio won't be here as well. So he'll be replaced by Dr. Stephen Riley. And uh, therefore, it looks like we have two speakers in the session, uh, one being uh, Dr. Stefano Guerra, the other Dr. Stephen Riley. Um, now, I just would like to remind you of uh, a few rules. Each speaker has around 20 minutes, but since we are missing uh, one of the speakers, it might extend in a uh, moderate limit, of course. And then we'll have the uh, discussion part at the end of the session. And if uh, any of the participants would like to extend any question in written form, please do write down um, the speaker, the name of the speaker, uh, so that we can understand who, whom you're directing the question to. And um, so anything else before? Uh, no, so let me just stick, try to stick to the program and let us start with uh, Dr. Stephen Riley. Dr. Riley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for organizing this uh, excellent event. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now, but um, uh, you may have to be indulgent while I struggle. Let's try the slide with this. No problem. Uh, is is my are, are my PowerPoints visible? Not at the moment, I guess. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> now we can see it. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, that's a that's a minor miracle. That's a good start. Um, uh, once again, thank you, thank you very much for for, for hosting me, and and thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, 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 and indeed timely event. I'm going to try very hard to stick to my twenty minutes, um, uh, uh, and not intrude on uh, uh, Stefano's time. Um, my concern is is the uh, concept of law and the possibility of losing the concept of law in a broken future and the the underlying method the underlying concern of what i'm doing here is very simple i'm taking some insights from this book by tim mulgan ethics for a broken world uh, which is a book predominantly about political philosophy and aiming to apply them to legal philosophy so it's as simple as that i'm going to spell out the the thought experiment at the heart of this book I'm going to uh, uh, try and apply that to uh, legal philosophy. It's as simple, simple as that. Uh, what does this book do? Well, it's, a, it's a, a thought experiment about future people. It's a thought experiment that intends, in a sense, to put the state of nature in our future and make it a state that we can't escape from. It's a plausible future concerned with uh, environmental degradation, uh, and the deterioration of our natural world. Uh, it's uh, conjecturing a world several generations in our future where there is a, a non-hospitable environment for humans. 
uh, and where our affluent way of life is no longer an option. And this, this, this term affluent requires just a moment of explanation. Affluent here is not simply a standard, but relates to a mindset. It relates to our mindset in the 20th and 21st century. The, uh, a certain relationship with resources and the earth, uh, which is uh, untenable or no longer holds in this uh, uh, inhospitable future world. So why, why create this or craft this possible future? Well, one, it starts to shut down certain immediate policy questions that we might ask. We've already inhabited, we already know what the future looks like, so we don't have to worry too much about immediate policy concerns. Um, uh, secondly, we can cut down some of the paradoxical concerns about, about future generations and our relationship to them. Uh, uh, and skepticism about a normative relationship with these future people, our future generations. They already exist in this thought experiment, and our job is to inhabit their world and look back at the 20th and 21st century, look at the philosophy that's taking place now, and see whether that failed or succeeded to uh, 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 ameliorate, uh, to mitigate, or to adapt in anticipation of the broken future. So it sets up a conflict between our, our, our world and the future world. Uh, it's pressure on a lot of assumptions about uh, material resources and a favorable environment. And, uh, and above all, uh, and, uh, this is a, a pretty crucial point, in the future world, there is a survival lottery. So not everybody can survive in these unfavorable conditions. It's not plausible for people, everybody to reproduce in an unlimited way. So there is a survival lo lottery. Uh, some people will have to be sacrificed in order to maintain uh, a, a reasonable standard of life for people in the future. Now, this horrific possibility is not something that Mulligan is asking us to endorse. He's simply asking us to imagine that this is already uh, a fait accompli. It's already in place. And from the perspective of the people inhabiting this position, what does our 21st century thinking look like so that's the job that's the essence of this of this thought experiment and in a nutshell he gives us these diagnoses of political philosophy he says that even uh, uh quite innocuous liberal political philosophy rawlsian philosophy has a mildly progressive uh, element to it there's ideas of just savings in, in rules that allow the conditions of the possibility to continue uh uh, endlessly into the future. And that, from the point of view of the broken future, is an illegitimate assumption. Our theories of consequentialism, or wherever our political theories include consequentialism, they include uh, a failure to uh, envisage future states of affairs, uh, uh, and the systematic failure in consequentialism to have a, a consistent or clear theory of human well-being. That's what we need in order to conceptualize future generations and consequentialism offers it, but offers lots of different versions that we can't really adjudicate between. The future people look back at Nozickian political philosophy based on uh, 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 Lockean uh, rights theory and find that very much wanting, find that uh, particularly egregious in its assumptions about a bountiful world. Um, and and, uh, and Nozick comes in for a particular criticism here. And finally, without pretending to have exhausted the, 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 all the elements of this book, there is a persistent concern with the ideas of the circumstances of justice, and this is going to be important. So I'm going to labor this just for a, a moment more. Uh, the circumstances of justice is an idea, uh, it's a phrase coined by Hume, it was picked up again by Rawls, and it's the idea that we can assume as a background assumption, moderate sociability and moderate scarcity in our theorizing about politics. That is to say, we can assume that people are moderately sociable, they're not, they're not completely aggressive towards one another, they have limited spheres of concern, but without some, assum so some assumption of moderate sociability, our political theories couldn't get off the ground. But more to the point, we can assume, or we should assume for human rules and others, moderate scarcity. That is to say that resources are, uh, uh, are scarce, but not so scarce that we're in a state of extremists. That there is, because of this moderate scarcity, we can talk about corrective justice, we can talk about distributive justice. Without moderate scarcity, neither of those would be meaningful. 
if everything was abundant, we wouldn't need justice. And if we're in a state of uh, extreme need, we couldn't talk about justice. We have moderate scarcity. And that assumption is precisely what the future people of the broken world are going to try to unpick and challenge. And, the, and this is important not only because it challenges political philosophy and mainstream liberal political philosophy, but this assumption is imported wholesale into much contemporary jurisprudence, not least Hart's uh, concept of justice, if you can call it, a concept of law, if you can call that contemporary. So all I'm going to do for the rest of the paper, and I have, let me see, five, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Let's try and make it 10. All I'm going to do now is to try to take those insights and to apply them to jurisprudence. Uh, Mulgan has, doesn't have much concern with, with law, doesn't have any concern with jurisprudence. That's the question for us. And what I'm going to start off with is just to identify some temporal assumptions in some theories of jurisprudence. At this point, I'm not making any evaluations. I'm simply identifying some temporal assumptions that I think we should start to unpack. So the first is from, from Finnis and, and from his modern natural law position. And within his uh, his natural law position, he gives us a very moderately, very mildly progressivist story about the movement from uh, de facto power to de jure authority. Authority has to st start somewhere, it starts with power, it starts with a simple ability to command, but over time that, 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 that will become de jure authority, and it will become de jure authority if and only if the commander, the control of the sovereign, begins to respect the human rights of those that they govern. Okay. So this is a very familiar story. It's not very uh, 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 controversial. We find a variation on this in various, in various different uh, philosophies of law, but there it is. It's there in, in Finnis. Second, Dworkin. Dworkin's theory of, uh, uh, of, of law, uh, his interpretivism, his theory in law's empire, is a strongly temporalized vision of law but it's predominantly backwards looking. It's about taking the materials that are already accreted in a legal system in order to move forward, in order for the polity to move forward in a principled way. That's the role of law. It's an interpretive job, looking backwards to the materials that have accreted over time and projecting a principled future with integrity. Third, Hart. Hart's concept of law aims to be a, a conceptual, uh, uh, description, a descriptive sociology, he calls it, of, of law. But, but, but buried in that, and quite consistently throughout that, is, a, is an insistence that he's only talking about modern states and modern legal systems. He's not, conversely, talking about what he calls primitive legal systems. So there's already, uh, there's a certain kind of crude anchoring in modernity in Hart's concept of law. We know that he was reading lots of Weber, a lot of there's a Weber in the background, even though he's not very explicit about this. This is what his idea of, his concept of law is tied very much to modernity, the Weberian uh, vision of modernity at that. And finally, I'm afraid this is my only non-Anglophone philosopher. I can only apologize for my uh, parochialism here, but Schmidt is here to represent the non-Anglophone world. Um, and, here, there is the temporalities are interesting. Um, there's complex temporalities, and, and and our next speaker, I think, might might, might well uh, shed more light on this. But Schmidt's going to talk about emergency, and he's going to talk about uh, exceptional powers becoming normalized. And I think this is this is important, particularly for for present concerns. But it's going to be important as we move forward into uh, less. Uh, 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 congenial climates as climate change takes hold, uh, exceptional powers and emergencies, of course, are, are likely to become more frequent. So Schmidt needs consideration, I think. For the remainder of the paper, all I'm going to do is just to unpack some of these very quickly without pretending to do it systematically, but that's all I'm doing is these four propositions are just going to be uh, explicated slightly more. So First, Finnis gave us this, this mildly progressivist narrative of a, a de, fa a de, a de facto to de jure authority. What's hidden in there that would be problematic to Mulgan's future people, his future generation in the broken world? First, can we have all the human rights that 
uh, Finnis takes for granted. It's certainly the case that there's at least one human right that future generations in a broken world might, may not enjoy, and that is the right to life. If there is a survival lottery, that implies that our right to life is qualified. The qualification of the right to life is the price that we pay for the enjoyment of all the other human rights that will be enjoyed in the future broken world. And there's something I think chillingly important about this proposition. It's clearly something not to be celebrated, but is it possible for us to guarantee the possibility of the right to life uh, for all future generations? Is it possible even to guarantee expensive rights like the right to a fair trial? It takes enormous resources to realize the human right to a fair trial. Is that something that will be guaranteed to future generations? Um, second, um, uh, Finnis is very concerned with the common good, and it's the common good that ties together authority and human rights, or, or, or uh, the, the basic goods, as Finnis calls them. Is this going to be possible in a future world? Is it going to be possible to have a neat narrative that ties together uh, realization of human rights, a common good, and therefore justification of authority? Uh, if we have non propitious or non or, or suboptimal conditions, Conditions, uh, do we have the conditions for authority? It's certainly authority as he envisages it. Finally, determinatio. There's, uh, in in, in, in Finnis, we have this uh, Thomist vision of the lawmaker, the good lawmaker, as a principal lawmaker uh, taking principles and realizing them uh, through legislation. Is this model attractive as it is, I think? Is this going to be possible? Not least because this model, I think, rests on a kind of an analogy between the human life, the human horizon of concern, and the lawmaker, and the lawmaker, as it were, uh, building uh, a good structure of law such that the people, the current generation, lead a good life that harmonizes authority and human rights. Is that meaningful? Is that defensible? Is that going to be meaningful at all in a broken world? Second, Dawkin and interpretivism. Um, here's a couple of things to say. First, Dawkins' interpretivism is, is, is unapologetically a, a reconstruction of the common law. Uh, and that's a problem in itself, um, but also that it's reflected in a certain kind of fear about floodgate problems and floodgate problems in common law. It's a way of constraining common law uh, adjudication. It says that, OK, we, we grant a great deal of powers to the judiciary, but you should avoid uh, uh, decisions that open floodgates, that open uh, a wide number of possible grounds of uh, 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 um, litigation. Uh, and that's a very crude concern with the future. It's about shutting down a concern with the future. It says that our judges shouldn't really be concerned with the future. And they certainly should be concerned with distributive justice. They should be concerned only with corrective justice. And this crude concern with, with, with floodgates, I think, is part of the problem there. Second in Law's Empire, Dworkin is very rude about priests. And these are people that he thinks treat law simply as social engineering and only look forwards only look to what law can be what can be done with law in an, a, a very instrumental sense uh, and, and if it were only this crudely instrumental conception of law that that, that that he was concerned with then perhaps we could agree with him but i think he's perhaps much too quick to criticize those who want to see law as a tool for thinking forward for planning into the future uh, Dworkin is much too critical and much too dismissive i think of this pragmatist uh, uh, element third uh, and finally, uh, uh, this for me is the most devastating point. D Dawkins' theory of law is, is, is irreducibly statist. There's so little, it's, it's staggering how little concern there is with international law in law's empire. Um, and I presume that if we're going to do something about climate change and we're going to adapt and mitigate, there has to be some kind of principled interaction between the domestic and the international. Dawkins has nothing to say about that. Dawkins not alone in that, but he has nothing to say about that. Third, his positivism. We've already, I've, I've mentioned Hart, and Hart um, has some implicit temporal assumptions, which I think are interesting and also problematic. He also looks at um, 
the circumstances of justice. And as I've suggested, he kind of endorses the circumstances of justice. He says, yes, of course, law only applies where there is moderate scarcity, only applies when there is moderate sociability. So Hart plugs straight into this, this assumption about the circumstances of justice. But what he doesn't do is, is endorse a fully functionless conception of law that says law and legal systems are there to ensure the survival of societies into the future. He's not prepared to, to endorse that as a necessary element in law. He says contingently, it tends to be the case that legal systems serve to preserve a society moving into the future, but that's not necessarily true of law. I think that's a very problematic assumption. I'll come back to that very briefly in, in my conclusion. Um, the second point here refers to the work of Shapiro, Scott Shapiro, and his planning theory of law. I mean, suffice it to say that on the face of it, a planning theory of law looks much more attractive in terms of thinking about the future and future generations. Um, I, I, I'm very skeptical about that, in fact, and I think it says little or nothing about cross-generational cooperation. Um, this is very unfair to Shapiro, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, the third point here refers to, to, to Raz and some deeper problems in terms of exclusionary reasons and authority. Law for Raz creates exclusionary reasons for action. That is to say, it excludes all our other reasons for acting. It excludes our conscience, for instance, or our moral instincts. Is it justified in doing that? Well, it's just in that if law is bringing collective or cooperative benefits. Um, if, however, we're in a suboptimal broken future, then these exclusionary reasons seem much less justified and therefore legal authority seems much less justified. If we are in a state of extremis, is it really legitimate for somebody else to exclude my reasons for action, my own moral reasons for action, my own conscience? Finally, the, the Schmittian position or the neo-Schmittian position to do with the with emergency and the normalization emergency. Well, again, I think this, this raises some impertinent questions. I mean, I have to say on the face of it, though, it's not, it's not to me a very attractive theory of law. It tells us a great deal about the interaction of law and politics, um, but I'm not sure that, that Schmidt or his later acolytes tell us a great deal about law as such. Um, but that said, and I, I'm happy to be corrected on that, I think Schmidt rightly points us off towards uh, uh, endemic emergency and, and looking towards that as, a, as, a, as, a, as part of the horizon of legal concern. He points us towards the fact that we are declaring climate emergencies in various jurisdictions and at the UN level. And it'd be interesting to ask and put some pressure on, on what that means. Does that actually have any legal content? Can that have legal content? If we are in a state of climate emergency, if we have declared an emergency, does that simply mean that we're handing executive powers over to the executive in order to do something uh, quick, in order to respond to this urgent problem? I don't know. And does Schmidt tell us the right answer to that, I'm not quite sure. What Schmidt also does at the same time is put pressure on, on the relationship here between law and democracy. Because of course, one of the problems when it comes to adaption and mitigation and climate change is that we're stuck in short term, many of us are short, in short term electoral cycles, which aren't good for long term planning. The legal system at the same time is the long term conscience of the society as Dworkin would agree, that as it were, transcends these short-term cycles. But this presents us with a paradox, and this is the point I'll leave Schmidt on, that at the same time, we want to transcend the political. We want law to, as it were, entrench certain kinds of obligations that will allow us to adapt and mitigate. Uh, but we want that at the same time in a way that doesn't negate democracy. So there's a, there's a paradox to be overcome here between long-term law and short-term electoral cycles. So, uh, and leave you with the questions, the jurisprudential questions that I think this raises. I mean, we, we can ask all sorts of po interesting policy questions, and there are all sorts of very deep and pressing regulative questions about what we should do about climate change and the environment and sustainability. But I'm not asking those questions here. I'm asking what do those problems entail in terms of law as such, law as structure, law as social structure, and whether ultimately, if we end up in a broken future, whether we will lose law altogether, whether it's possible for the concept of law to be eroded. 
if the circumstances of, don't, of justice don't hold, then it might look very well like law itself cannot hold. That if there is no moderate scarcity, if there's real scarcity, then pr presumably there can be no law. But I think to get that proposition needs unpacking, serious unpacking. It needs unpacking at the level of justice. So if the, if the circumstances of justice don't hold, does that mean that we don't have law? I don't think that's necessarily the same thing. If the circumstances that, that give us uh, distributive and corrective justice don't hold, that isn't automatically a negation of the existence of law as a social structure. Why? And here's the second question, because law, for a start, is ambiguous. That is to say, we could have some kind of demarcation of law through sociological methods, but we could also just reconstruct our idea of law. We can just say, like, our, our, we have a theory of law that will exist in the future, regardless of the absence of the circumstances of justice. And third, and finally, I think that connects with the question of functionalism. That is to say, the question of if we can say that there is a necessary relationship between law and keeping societies alive. Is there a necessary relationship between law or legal systems and serving to maintain humanity in a fundamental existential sense? A lot of the theorists that I've mentioned here will, uh, will say that law tends to do that, but they don't say that law must do that. And I'd like to think that if we had a reconstructive vision of law, we might be able to say that law must uh, serve to ensure the survival of humanity in the future, not just that it tends to. Thank you. Sorry, I have to unmute myself first. Thank you, Dr. Riley, for this, uh, how to say, um, some, um, for this speech that raises a little concerns about our future, which we have been talking about from the beginning uh, of this webinar, because we started with the possibility of a diagnosis, which we couldn't come up with uh, any solutions. And now we have the problem of a future. Uh, it is fragmented. It is. Uh, it looks like uh, we are losing the power of trust um, to our future, which has a functional um, which raises a functional concern. So um, let us move on to Dr. Stefano Guerra. Um, he's from uh, University of Macerata and he'll be speaking about um, the concepts of emergency and exception, which will be closely related to the first um, presentation. So uh, Dr. Guerra, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm presenting and my lawyer, Stefano Guerra. I obtained uh, my PhD in legal sciences. I'm an uh, honorary fellow and lecturer in philosophy of law uh, at the Department of Law uh, of the University of Macerata. Uh, I'm uh, very delighted and honored to participate at this important international conference. And uh, I am so thankful uh, for uh, the invitation to the whole organization of, the, of this webinar. And in particular uh, to Professor Uyghur for the kind correspondence and uh, Professor Kataluk for the presentation. Uh, besides, I'm very content to take part to this meeting. It's a great opportunity to learn new things, to know distinguished colleagues around the world. And to talk about uh, a, a fundamental topic uh, as the, the crisis uh, about law from the perspective of uh, legal and political philosophers. So um, preliminary, I intend to start with the, the title of our webinar, The Philosophy and Law or the Philosophy of Law in Times of Crisis. Um, if it's true that many problems of our day concern the law, uh, the legal philosophy can help us to discuss and find solutions to the crisis uh, we are experiencing. So, uh, in my presentation first, uh, I consider as uh, necessary to ask uh, ourselves the question of the philosophy of law. Uh, try to define what it is and delimit its field of action. Uh, second, uh, to think about uh, the crisis lived by humanity as a concept. 
and then to identify uh, a specific crisis uh, around which the philosophy of law uh, is, uh, is called upon to investigate. Uh, third, uh, I intend to enter in the, the physiognomy of the crisis and outline its themes. Uh, I consider uh, useful uh, to ask uh, for it from the south of the classics, uh, whose teaching goes beyond the, the 20th century. This is uh, to give uh, different interpretations of the contemporary constitutional political crisis uh, through the analysis of uh, transversal concepts useful for identifying the crisis factors of a state. Uh, sovereignty, uh, emergence, and uh, exception theorized by uh, Walter Benjamin, Carl Schmitt, and Giorgio Agamben. In this way, we will lay the theoretical foundation from which to start looking first for the dangers for constitutional democracies, and then for suitable solutions to resolve the crisis at the political constitutional level in the European uh, juridical political context. So moving from our discipline, philosophy of law, we know that anyone who comes across philosophy of law is in a situation that existentially involves his personality to a more or less uh, significant. Wondering what philosophy of law is means becoming aware of a personal situation, uh, I mean. A moment uh, of our destiny that is not entirely indifferent. If uh, existence is made us encounter an activity of uh, reflection, our being human forces us to face it in order to become aware of what it means. Therefore, uh, I believe it is necessary to speak briefly first of all about our reference subject. Well, asking uh, the question of the philosophy of love means uh, opening up to the problems that culture poses with regard to both philosophy and law, comparing them with the human experience. In my opinion, the philosophy of law must consider legal activity in all its peculiar manifestations in order to catch an essential attitude of human experience. Uh, I think that this simple reference to human facts is enough to understand the two fundamental aspects. First, the law cannot be understood in its nature and in its uh, raison d'etre without referring to human being. Second aspect, uh, I think it's uh, so relevant, is that uh, the observation of human activity from the perspective of law can be truly illuminating. Today, uh, it's impossible to consider uh, legal experience as uh, isolated or, uh, or partial compared to other existential experiences. We live in, a, in an era in which uh, looking at the global experience uh, from a legal perspective has uh, its own profound historical justification and existential relevance, perhaps uh, decisive. In other words, uh, uh, legal philosophers or um, jury jurists in, in general, uh, have not to forget that the problem is the human being in his uh, integral humanity. And uh, I am quoting Sergio Cotta that uh, was uh, a, a legal philosopher uh, uh, of the last century. Having given a frame of our discipline uh, and having identified the subject uh, of our research, uh, uh, we can move on, on to its object, the crisis. So crisis, uh, uh, in my opinion, is uh, the moment of truth. It's not God's judgment, but it allows man's judgment, criticism. The crisis and uh, criticism do justice to the illusions and pseudo-truth that for many years mainstream culture has given to the last two generations, uh, among 40 years, uh, probably. The crisis uh, does not bring out an alternative truth submerged in the neoliberal swamps. If anything, it makes visible to all fractures and contradictions already structurally present in the dominant economic, social, and political paradigm. 
but seen by few and suffered by many as natural or accidental or inevitable. Uh, the crisis shows that uh, mainstream truths were and are concerned with lies. Uh, in short, it is uh, undisputed that uh, constitutional democracy is experiencing a period of uh, crucial importance for its uh, existence. It is exposed to ever stronger threats and therefore to a crisis that threatens to corrode the constitutional foundations of uh, democracy, devastating effects on uh, democratic coexistence. The current crisis uh, sees an uncertain social constitutionalism. This is the, the point. Uh, we have a representative crisis of the parties and parliaments and an evident difficulty in in uh, managing the economic financial crisis uh, that affects the effectiveness of social rights and the democratic natures of the states. Uh, this is in the broader uh, European uh, supranational context uh, in which uh, there is no form of governance of the crisis uh, with uh, inadequate intergovernmental agreements between states. And this is a, a big problem uh, uh, for uh, EU and the, for uh, EU uh, member states and uh, for democracy. The contemporary crisis of the Western world uh, as a change uh, in the functioning of constitutional powers leads to the creation of a plebiscite and the populist leaderships and to the formation of governments whose parliamentary form is uh, presumably governed only by mere constitutional formalities represented by the trust relationship between government and parliament. In fact, uh, the parliamentary form that can be observed in the real constitution, uh, to use the, uh, the words of Costantino Mortati, uh, seems to be uh, characterized by the mere desecration of the executives by parliaments and the transfer of the same substantial formation of the political direction to government uh, technicians. Uh, and it's uh, an, ex an example uh, the situation uh, uh, in the Italian uh, government. The goal is to make uh, adequate policies uh, to overcome uh, the economic and financial crisis that involves the, the very holding of the welfare state and, uh, and overall uh, the effectiveness uh, of rights, of social rights. So um, I want to speak about uh, the classics now um, and to outline the arguments for this crisis, uh, I will appeal to the thoughts uh, of uh, of a few classics. They are uh, classic because uh, they are uh, undated, holders of uh, a language that meets the, the conjuncture uh, of time. The relationship uh, between uh, emergency and uh, exception and the downsizing of uh, popular sovereignty in the face of the powers of the European Union and transnational lobbies are, uh, in my opinion, fundamental cross-cutting themes of research from which to move to identify the crisis factors uh, of a state. Furthermore, uh, the issues of emergency and uh, exception have strongly returned to the center of the legal political debate, also in reference to the management of the coronavirus pandemic and the consequent crisis uh, caused by uh, individual states. In this regard, uh, a comparison uh, is useful between uh, Walter Benjamin, for who, uh, the state of emergency in which we live uh, is the rule, Carl Schmitt, uh, and for Carl Schmitt, the, the rule lives only in the ex exception. The sovereign uh, is who decides on the state of exception. And uh, Giorgio Agamben, an Italian philosopher, um, for him the exception is uh, the original form of law. In this way, uh, by the classics, uh, we lay the theoretical foundations from which to start to analyze this crisis at the political constitutional level. Uh, in the legal political European context. 
So this is uh, our uh, area of research. Here we find uh, uh, other criticism about the popular sovereignty of member states uh, faced with the, the EU predominant order or uh, juridical and institutional levels. We move uh, uh, from uh, Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt uh, is uh, among the major authors to have uh, reflected on the state of um, exception. In political uh, theology, or uh, in uh, the dictatorship too, we find the concepts of uh, sovereignty, decision, and the state of exception. Schmidt believes that uh, legal theories must be linked uh, to current political and social situations. The concrete situation is preeminent over abstract constructions. The concrete case takes the name of a state of exception in Schmidt. And this is a situation in which the internal order or the survival of the state are compromised by economic or political crisis, not attributable to a regulatory system. As it cannot be foreseen or regulated in advance, it becomes a concreteness. This cannot be subsumed into a regulatory system. It cannot be translated into a case, into a concrete case. And this involves the, the suspension of the, the legal system. And this is the, the central point of the question. Hence, the, the distinction between abstract juridical prediction and concrete not. In other words, the state of uh, exception uh, show what uh, normality cannot relieve. And now uh, we speak about Kelsen, that is uh, an adversary of, uh, of Schmidt. So uh, this opponent, uh, this, uh, this famous jurist uh, in the 19th century, denounced that the state of exception as a pre-juridical um, and uh, indicated that the, the constituent power as the advocate of a juridical order that forces and uh, uh, regulates um, every case within the boundaries of the rules. And in this dispute between uh, Schmidt and Kelsen, the first one argues that uh, the normativists, as Kelsen uh, was, end up uh, ignoring the reality of political and sociological changes, leaving out the, the crucial problem of the case of uh, exception, which by definition cannot be bound to any norm. Uh, no rule is applicable to a chaos, says Schmidt uh, in the political theology. The exception cannot be subsumed into a standard and therefore uh, strictly uh, cir uh, circumscribed. So the question is, uh, quis judicabit or uh, quis interpretabitur? Uh, who actually decides uh, in the event of a conflict uh, where does the interest of the state, uh, security, and public order consist? Or in other words, uh, who can decide when the state of exception uh, occurs and what measures are needed to restore the situation uh, to normality? Well, to, to this question, Schmidt replies by stating that uh, sovereign is uh, whoever decides on the state of exception. The decision differs from the legal norm, says Schmidt. And uh, the authority demonstrates that it does not need law to create law. The decision frees itself from all regulatory limits, while the state, uh, in the case of a, um, an exception, suspends the right by virtue of a right of self preservation. In any case, uh, although uh, a crisis may induce the, the sovereign to, to go beyond the rules uh, in force uh, or uh, to temporarily suspend the constitution, it still operates within uh, a legal context uh, and the, in a constitutional context. Possible constitutional uh, deviations are permitted only for the purpose of safeguarding uh, the constitution and restoring uh, the order and security necessary 
for the, for the functioning of the legal system. Uh, in this way, the sovereign is placed outside, outside the legal system uh, in Schmidt, while being an integral part of it. Um, this uh, observation, this theory of Schmidt received uh, a lot of critic, uh, but not uh, uh, from uh, normatives uh, only, but um, Wall, the, the Jews philosophical debate uh, in the time of uh, Weimar Republic and uh, in the last time too. It is precisely at this point that Schmidt's ideas of, of sovereignty dictatorship and presidential power converge. The sovereign has the power to declare a state of exception. Uh, the sovereign has the power to establish a commissioner di dictatorship to resolve the crisis. And for uh, uh, commissioner dictatorship, uh, um, I mean the term that Schmidt used uh, in his uh, masterpiece that was uh, uh, the dictatorship in uh, in 21 of the 19th century so in the weimar republic uh, the state of exception uh, is declared by the, the reich's president the president of, of the state uh, that in schmidt uh, was a, a dictator uh, commissioner in a situation of crisis this is a a, a, a short uh, panorama uh, of uh, the state of exception, emergency and decision uh, in Schmidt. And uh, now we, uh, we talk about uh, another um, thinker uh, of the last century, that is uh, Walter Benjamin. So, according, uh, according to, to Benjamin, uh, however, the sovereign's task is uh, to avoid the state of exception. And this is a, a substantial difference uh, um, to Schmidt. So the sovereign task is to avoid the state of exception, certainly not to decide, uh, to decide it. The sovereign had to avoid uh, his delegitimation uh, since this was the state of exception until the seventh, uh, 17th century. The modern conception of the state of exception, uh, which assigns absolute power to the, the sovereign, not only uh, overturns uh, uh, its ancient meaning, but implies a profound transformation of the idea of history. If for Schmidt the state of exception occurs in moments of a maximum crisis, for Walter Benjamin, it must be continually operated in order to unmask its juridical forms in order to maintain relations of domination from the point of view of the, the tradition of the oppressed. In this regard, uh, Schmidt's uh, position is defined as decisionism, while that of Benjamin as uh, hyper-decisionism. Uh, Benjamin uh, believes that the decision uh, does not consist so much in the element uh, that was out of the norm, while constituting its logical basis, but rather as it had always been the only norm of behavior of the ruling classes that made history. In summary, uh, according to, to Benjamin, uh, the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that uh, the state of emergency in which we live is the rule. So, uh, it is necessary to arrive at a concept of history in Benjamin that corresponds to this fact. And, uh, and we will see uh, what George Agamben uh, thinks about uh, this, um, this theory. So, an Italian philosopher, uh, Giorgio Agamben, dealt with Schmidt and Benjamin uh, much later. Uh, he's a contemporary. In his book, uh, The State of Exception, Agamben develops uh, his analysis uh, of the state of exception. Um, in this monograph, uh, 
he laments that absence of an organic reflection on the theory of the state of exception. And uh, jurists uh, seem to consider the problem more as a, more, a, a mere factual question than as an actual problem inherent in the sphere of law. This is a, a critic point in the theory uh, of Giorgio Agamben. He calls uh, the, the paradox of uh, sovereignty the fact that the sovereign is at the same time inside and outside the legal system in a relationship of uh, ecstasy belonging to it. This is analyzed uh, starting from Schmitt's philosophical juridical reflection. Uh, from this, uh, uh, Giorgio Agamben uh, takes up the conception uh, of the state of exception to which uh, he makes uh, some modifications, uh, filling the exception with content. The real stake uh, uh, in the reflection on the state of exception uh, is the question of the relationship between violence and law. This is an important point uh, that was uh, studied uh, by Walter Benjamin Toon. The relationship between violence and law. The state of exception uh, in Agamben makes it possible for violence to occur that is neither prohibited nor permitted, as it occurs in a condition of suspension of the law taking place without uh, any relationship with the legal sphere. The state of exception is not a dictatorship, uh, but an empty space of law, uh, in the opinion of our uh, uh, thinker. The state of necessity is a not a state of law, but a space without law. It is uh, to this uh, indefinibility and this uh, non-place that the idea of a force of law responds. Uh, at the time of the globalization of uh, capital and preventive war, the state of exception reached its maximum planetary deployment. Therefore, Agamben refers uh, to Benjamin, for which it is uh, necessary to produce a, a, an effective state of exception, as there is no longer a distinction between exception and norm. He reveals that the, the, to the exclusive advantage of the executive. Uh, so shortly, the, the, the absolute predominance of uh, emergency uh, degree becomes the normal way of legislating in modern European and I think uh, also non-European constitutional democracies. In a sort of, a, uh, how can I say, uh, a, a perennial and never revocable state of exception. So uh, the dangers of constitutional democracies uh, are, uh, are closely connected to the concept of the state of exception. The state of exception tends more itself as the dominant paradigm of government of contemporary politics. It happened in the Weimar uh, Republic uh, with Article uh, 48 and uh, in many cases uh, through our history. For example, just think of the spasmodic use of the decree law in Italy as an ordinary uh, source of law production. But uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, decree uh, legislation. And uh, this situation, uh, this practice, uh, produces the expansion of the executive uh, to the detriment of a parliament and other representative institutions uh, which mark the downsizing of popular sovereignty. Today, uh, as yesterday, as in the Weimar Republic too, uh, therefore, it is necessary to continually confront the results of the social sciences and historical events to identify the hazards and the perils that the constitutional state of a pluralist uh, democracy uh, runs or uh, risks uh, to run. Uh, and these perils are uh, represented above all by authoritarian drifts constituted by centralization of, uh, of powers in the executive and uh, judiciary to the detriment of parliamentarism, but also from uh, uh, populist and uh, technocratic drifts. 
and with this also oligarchic uh, drift, uh, delegitimization of parties, distance between uh, institutions and people, monopoly of economic and financial powers. Related to this uh, is also the great unsolved problem uh, of the popular sovereignty of the EU member states which is the, the transfer of important sovereign prerogatives of its member states, which, however, risk being uh, entangled in mechanism of uh, dubious democracy and uh, effectiveness. If powers uh, uh, have no limits and remain unchecked, there is an high risk that they will concentrate and accumulate in the absolute forms. Therefore, it is necessary not only to defend but also to rethink and reestablish uh, the system of guarantees of the democratic circuit at the national, supranational, and conventional level, using new theoretical basis uh, on which to elaborate the regulatory corrections to the related legal uh, systems. So um, I'm uh, I'm going to uh, to the conclusions of uh, of my presentation. Um, and I, 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 will, uh, I will return to the title of, of this webinar, The Philosophy of Law in Times of Crisis. Of crisis. The philosophy of law can serve the, the cooks of the, uh, of the crisis of modern democracies, identifying its components and tracing, to, uh, tracing the theoretical lines for uh, uh, an interdisciplinary framework uh, and finding innovative solutions to the current social, economical, and political changes connected to it. The crisis in general, in fact, needs thinking on the scientific level rather than answers on the political one. And some further research uh, hypotheses related to our team. Concurrent with the, the crisis uh, of uh, contemporary uh, democracies, uh, there is a need for more democracy in the name of direct and as a much broader participation in the discussion of public affairs and therefore of popular sovereignty. Therefore, uh, there is no reaction of democratic principles uh, and of the institutions and mechanisms set up to protect them. However, uh, from the picture outlined so far, it seems clear that the gap between uh, ideal democracy and the real democracy, to quote uh, uh, another Italian philosopher uh, that is uh, Norberto Bobbio, is still sub substantial. Uh, the promises made have not been fully kept. Uh, democracy is uh, perhaps overloaded politics. This, uh, in, uh, in turn, has abused its powers and uh, induced the legal system to stretch too far on the rights and uh, little on the duties of individuals in societies uh, faced with the challenges of uh, substantial cultural uh, renewal. Anyway, the risks for democracy are answered with uh, a mobile project based on an ambitious idea of humanity and uh, political coexistence on the relaunch of the normative uh, legacy of subjectivity, which allows the construction of an horizon of a meaning uh, capable of a symbolic attraction, but not regressive and anti-modern. All these uh, safeguarding the subjective freedom of individuals within the framework of a renewed legal order in its constitutional framework and favoring an emancipatory conception of the people. Uh, in Europe, we need not less, but more politics to prevent an uh, undemocratic use of democracy. Another solution is the reconstruction of parties as a bulwark of uh, pluralism. Um, democracies uh, are uh, historical constructions and the rights uh, are uh, never a definitive conquest. Populism, uh, by example, in contemporary democracy, uh, 
maybe is the proof uh, that the regression towards uh, an idea of a more closed society is never averted. In general, today's uh, game uh, of constitutional democracy, I mean, is played uh, in the recomposition of the fracture between uh, democracy and constitutionally. Uh, the one that the constitutions born in the second half of the 20th century have already tried to recompose, uh, combining the principle of uh, popular sovereignty uh, with the, the, the principle of superiority of the constitutional to, to the law. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Guerra, for this very illuminating speech. So um, perhaps uh, I need to make some concluding remarks. Uh, it is obvious that philosophy uh, finds some fertile grounds, unfortunately, uh, for itself in this crisis. Uh, it's even like a laboratory for uh, legal philosophy, in a sense. So the abstract concepts of emergency exception, oppression, they're all the constitutional democracy are all subject to examination in a sense of history. So we're living in a historical turning point in that sense. We all suffer from em environmental crisis and it's the limits of the capitalism actually. And uh, we have this pandemic and uh, plus we are facing some sorts of, uh, all sorts of political oppression in our countries in the name of dealing with the crisis. And the two presenters uh, made it really clear how the connections can be seen from uh, two different perspectives. Uh, but um, I know that we, we all know that the similar vulnerabilities of the people are at, at stake. So I'm sure you're going to receive uh, many questions from our audience. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, raise your hands or write down in chat um, so that I can share it with the speakers. Oh, uh, Mr. Chalar Chomes, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I have one question and my question is for uh, the first presenter, Mr. Riley. Um, maybe you touched upon this at the beginning of your presentation, but I'm not sure whether I understood it um, correctly. So what exactly is the motivation for thinking about, for thinking of a broken future. For example, I, when, you were, when you were explicating the details of the implications of thinking about such a future, I, I, I thought that there might be at least two alternatives or two motivations for thinking about this kind of a, a pessimistic future. First, um, one can think that thinking about thinking of such a future uh, might have meta-theoretical um, advantages. For example, as you yourself did in your presentation, one can think about, about, a, a, about a future like this and then see the implications for the theories that we right now have. But if this is the motivation, then one can say that, okay, one can equally think about a much more um, optimistic future and do the same thing and check the implications of a an open, optimist, very optimistic future and evaluate our existing theories on the basis of that good future instead of a bad future like the broken one. And the second one might be, um, the second motivation might be to think that this uh, broken future is not only a um, thought experiment. It's more than a thought experiment. And one can, one can argue that it's a, it's a real possibility that we are approaching such a future. And then, it's, and then it ceases to be only a, a thought experiment. And then, we need to, and then we need to think that, okay, if this is a real possibility, then we need to make our preparations for such a future. So what exactly is the motivation for thinking about a, a broken future? Is it only a meta, meta uh, theoretical tool for us to evaluate our existing theories or is it really a, a real possibility that awaits us? Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
you, you're you're quite right to put put uh, pressure on those questions, and I think to the extent that I or in turn Morgan have justified it, it's predominantly in negative terms. I suppose that we're cutting away um, certain kinds of contemporary or presentist preoccupations in order to simply uh, uh, make a, a, a plausible future from which intuitions can be uh, 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 farmed. Um, so in, the, in that sense, it's, it's more of the first option, in a sense, um, uh, in, in order to avoid certain kind of stultifying or, or, or uh, 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 um, paradoxical concerns with future generations generated by various the theorists, we simply stipulate the future uh, 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 and yield some intuitions from that. Uh, and I think, I mean, to, to, to a degree, that's an end in itself. Uh, and this and points, I think, to the second or, or the, 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 the interim proposition here, which is why not choose a positive or a successful or, a, a, or a, an attractive future? Um, well, the first thing to say is that we've, we've done plenty of that for quite some time. Um, various traditions, um, uh, various traditions that I have sympathy with, um, not least the, 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 the socialist traditions, plural, have uh, worked with certain kinds of positive uh, futures, certain kinds of teleologies that I won't say are, are falsified, but are looking less and less um, uh, realistic or looking less and less persuasive. So even if we're not strictly or empirically somehow taking those off the table, we need to entertain the possibility that those optimistic teleologies are, are, are no longer something that we should be uh, planning our politics or our law around. Um, is, it, is, is this meant to prepare us for the future? No, I, I don't think so, but I think it is meant to, um, to knock people like me out of a certain kind of presentist complacency about the philosophy of law, that it does contain perennial or timeless assumptions. It really does have some very contentious, temporalized assumptions that we really do need to, to attack. I mean, critical legal studies has already done that by, by other routes, it seems to me. So there's a, there's, a, there's a certain affinity here with critical legal studies. But I think by, by really putting the emphasis on future, future generations and a broken future, we can yield, we can really put some pressure on the sociological assumptions within jurisprudence uh, and not be quite so complacent about uh, the future. I hope, I hope that's a, an adequate answer to what was a very good uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have, I guess, Najib Ozan Kural, uh, right? Okay, go ahead, please, Mr. Kural. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riley, for your eye-opening presentation. My question is about the theme of the broken future. The end of the world has always been a recurring theme in human history. I mean, in the Middle Ages, people were sure that apocalypse was coming. And in the liberal society, danger has always been thematized uh, with the novels about crime. And today in Netflix, we always have these uh, dystopian TV series or such. Uh, what do you think about the connection between law and the concept of broken future when you think about it historically? Do you think the concept, I mean, is the, is the concept of broken future you explain now is a new challenge for the current law system or do you refer to it as a repetition of a theme that we had in the history? Thank you very much. Again, that's a, 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 a fantastic question. I feel, I feel even less, I feel, I feel there's an enormous amount in that and I, I fear I'm not gonna do it, not gonna do it justice. Um, certainly the, Apocalyptic theme is is um, is important, and as Stefano uh, mentioned uh, Benjamin, and Benjamin, of course, has always made some very powerful points about law, violence, uh, and the apocalypse. Much more persuasive, I think, than some of the just the the, the gloomy reflections of uh, Horkheimer and Adorno and the negative dialectics. I mean, they they reflected a certain kind of tragedy from the mid twentieth century, but I don't think they readied us for the slow burning apocalypse that is uh, 
climate change. Uh, Benjamin is much more interesting and, and, and nuanced uh, on that. Um, yeah, I mean, what are, what are we doing when we watch our, our apocalyptic or dystopian series on, um, on Netflix? I mean, I guess we're all coming to terms with the fact that the future is not what it used to be. Um, and that, that positive or optimistic narratives are, are, are looking less and less uh, 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 plausible. Um, so I, 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 I wish I had a richer uh, uh, cultural and critical story to tell you, but I, I can only hope that I'll, I'll make good on that in the future. Um, but, but I think um, I think the, one of the important things that, 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 that this, this experiment or this structuring of the future uh, gives us is, is turning our for lawyers or, or, or people doing jurisprudence, turning our head away from regulation and back towards constitution. I mean, it's quite easy to get hung up on environmental law or constitutional laws that may or may not help us to adapt, mitigate to climate change. Um, but I think we need to think about law as a whole, as, uh, as a constitut constitutive uh, 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 phenomenon in a in a co-constitutional relationship with the political and ask how that relates to a, a broken or a problematic future um, it's very tempting i think to get caught up in some of the regulative issues here because they're so important but i think our job as legal philosophers is to put aside the regulations for a moment to put aside the environmental regulations the human rights right regulations the constitutional regulations and really think in terms of what structurally law can and cannot do uh, what it can and cannot do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, democracy vis-a-vis -vis the future vis-a-vis uh, -vis preparing us for uh, what what's likely to be a very rocky ride um, so, two areas. I mean, an, an enormous food for thought. There, I, I'd, I, I'd love to talk further with you at some point about the about the cultural and the apocalyptic dimension of this. Um, but having said that, I've been quite immersed in some quite um, apocalyptic green literature at the moment, and it's it's not very cheery. So, I might have to spend a bit of time reading something something more optimistic for a while to cleanse my palate. But thank you. Uh, I guess I saw somebody else, oh, Zeynep, uh, Dr. Isper is willing to ask a question. Hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, to both of you for your presentations, first of all. Uh, my question is also for Steve. Um, before our webinar, I was reading your abstract and it had made me to think about a kind of inevitable dissolution of some traditional basis. And, and my thoughts are almost the same after the presentation. I mean, a kind of dissolution of our very own affluent tools that we apply a lot for justification in different manners in jurisprudence. And I wonder your thoughts about the role of the core concepts, which seems timeless and useless at the same time, ironically, um, such as, let's say, dignity that you also ponder on a lot. Uh, do you think, could we use it, for example, in jurisprudence for the future generations of this broken future, or um, are we also losing them too as law in your words? Thank you very much again for the presentation, and uh, it was nice to see you again. <laughs> oh, likewise, 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 always uh, fantastic to see you. And thank you for your, for your kind words and your kind, uh, kind question. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, if I go on too much now, you're going to have to stop me. Let me try and be succinct. But I think part, part of the reason why human dignity discourse has been important in constitutions and at the level of international legal discourse is that it helps to keep legal systems and normative fields dynamic and open to the future, to try and keep an openness to the future, to not lock us in to a certain kind of future. And that, that's been the merits, I think, of, of dignity discourse. It, it encourages us to look backwards to the kinds of horrors of the 20th century, what, what we want to avoid, but it also demands that we look forward and, and, and think in terms of the polity and, and the societies that we want to generate in the future. So dignity has been, I think, really crucial in that respect in terms of keeping, uh, keeping constitutions and keeping international human rights law open to the future. 
uh, and, and dynamic and changing relative to the future. Um, but if that's my, I mean, if that's always been one of my hobby horses, I know that one of your preoccupations has always been fuller and uh, the kind of uh, uh, the inner morality of law. And I think that's got to be part of the story here too, right? It's about the, the certain almost timeless virtues of lawmaking um, that ensure a marriage between law and human capacity what's possible for humans. Um, uh, and I think that's really important insight that Fuller gives us. What would be interesting would be to speculate how that relationship will change as what is possible for humans reduces. If law has to map or marry up with or reflect in a principled way what it is metaphysically possible and politically reasonable for humans to do or to have demanded of them, as that changes over time, then that that task, that morality of law will always also have to change with time as well. It seems to me. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I, I'm beginning to tread on your toes here, but I, I think uh, dignity has got to be part of this. In, in, in keeping l l the regulations, the regulative aspect of law, reflecting reality, uh, but. But it's the morality of law and that and that, that principled form of lawmaking and the connection with human agency and possibility that's 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 perhaps even more important here. So thank you. Good to see thank you. Thank you very much. Let me check the chat. We don't have any questions there. Uh, so, so we don't have any more questions. Let's call it a session then. Uh, is there anyone who is willing to ask one last question or make a comment or a final remark? Uh, Dr. Guerra, are you willing to make some final points or? Yes, yes. I, um... I can um, I can make a, 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 a presentation of, of my presentation uh, about the state of normalcy uh, to the state of exception um, to be uh, more uh, clear. In order to define uh, a situation where the state or uh, or uh, any agent is uh, is behaving in an uh, abnormal way. First, the conditions of normalcy are uh, to be established. In a normal situation, uh, the state is not facing any particular threat to, uh, to its existence or to the safety and the well-being of its citizens. And a situation of crisis uh, needs to be triggered by a threat. Three conditions must hold in order to justify a threatening situation. Necessity, uh, concreteness, and urgency. Uh, regarding the, the, the issue of necessity, the question that is to be answered is uh, quite simple and uh, aims to identify the reason why the state's structure needs some modification. Uh, the main purpose of the state, uh, as it has been argued by many scholars, uh, not only Schmidt, Agamben uh, and Benjamin, but uh, Kels and Tu and other contemporary, relates to the, the concept of self-preservation. Uh, self-preservation that is uh, a necessary condition to carry out uh, any task that may relate to the, the well-being of the citizens, the, the, the collection of taxes, the protection of, uh, of, uh, of borders, uh, and any other issue considered to be a, a specific function of the, of the state. Uh, a consensus among theorists uh, can be found on the idea that the state has to protect himself in order to keep functioning. Uh, following this uh, reasoning, uh, the state has to have uh, an instrument to react to any kind of threat uh, that may come either uh, from inside or outside its borders. Indeed, uh, the threatening situation used to justify the triggering of a state of exception and use the, the, the rehasping of the state's structure and the behavior is to uh, respond to some quantitative and qualitative characteristics. Thus, we speak of the concept of uh, 
concreteness and the urgency. Uh, I, will, I will be short. Uh, the question of, uh, of concreteness uh, relates to the, the practical definition of the, um, the XMI and the tree. In this uh, descriptive category, the state analyzes and thus defines the borders of the treat itself. And uh, a practical example can be found in a context of a natural catastrophe that uh, it's a particular state. In some cases, uh, the state may necessitate a firmer hold on the behavior of its citizens to better handle the aftermath of such a situation. At the end of the day, when, when speaking about the, the concreteness of a treat, the aim is to uh, investigate the scope of the emergency that is to be uh, dealt with, uh, defining in the most precise manner possible the temporal limits of the vicissitude. And uh, we are living uh, a, a bad period uh, in this sense. Uh, the, the issue of concreteness is deeply related with the last aspect in analysis, which is uh, urgency. A lack of uh, concreteness, in fact, leads to an absence of uh, urgency. And the second temporal definition of, of a treat that could justify the triggering of a state of exception is a uh, uh, point uh, urgency. In a situation of distress of uh, great proportion, uh, the state's effectiveness uh, is uh, uh, reacting to such a situation could result as uh, insufficient uh, in dealing with the, the threatening issue. Uh, the executive branch has a, a responsibility of protection towards its citizens, but uh, in contemporary parliamentary democracies, any action of the executive has to be approved by uh, the legislative body, often divided into one or more chambers uh, in Europe or in UK, for example. It is easy uh, to understand that the, the possibility of uh, uh, an immediate uh, uh, treat that implies uh, a, an immediate response from the government uh, may need uh, a shortened legislative and executive procedure to be able to oppose or limit the, the potential damages caused by the, the imminent uh, menace. Uh, this need, uh, perceived by the, the state's bodies, uh, uh, is exactly the concept of urgency. Emergencies of uh, any kind are therefore situations that uh, it the state in uh, an unforeseen, uh, unforeseeable or uh, unpreventable way uh, that exceed uh, the, the, the capacity of reaction that the state possesses uh, in, uh, in its normal... Uh, in, in its normal configuration. And so th this is the, uh, the, my last observation about the, the problems and about the, the solution that uh, a state can, uh, can, uh, can take. And uh, another, uh, another theory uh, that uh, philosophy of law can catch to, uh, to search for, uh, for solutions uh, at, uh, at the current crisis. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, especially our speakers and our, our audience and the organizers of the event. Uh, so we'll meet back uh, at four o'clock sharp, right? Professor Uygur. Uh, sorry, uh, 4.15. 4.15. Okay, 4.15. Then thank you very much once again and goodbye. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. Bye, Stephen. Thank you.